Almost Friday? Friday for this class, almost? Hello? All right. Um, have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into it. Uh, yesterday, I introduced the topic of uh, carbohydrates, particularly from a perspective of structure and nomenclature. And while I will show you a little bit more today about nomenclature and a little bit more about structure, uh, most of what I'll talk about today has more to do with higher order forms of uh, carbohydrates. Um, I'll remind you that last time I uh, described to you and showed you how we can have uh, various um, cyclic forms of carbohydrates that arise. They arise in solution. And uh, somebody asked me a question at the end about fissure, what, what, what's considered a fissure structure, et cetera. And um, there are some techy definitions to it. Technically, these are fissure structures because they've got this thing on the right, but um, I use any straight chain uh, designation as a fissure structure. So these are actually representations of cyclic uh, structures. So fissure, I will use the term uh, to refer to the linear and uh, not the cyclic uh, forms of um, uh, the various sugars. So these are what I would call Hayworths. And the Hayworth projections look, as you saw before, like this. Now, the Hayworth projections, I showed you yesterday what a pyranose uh, looked like. And a pyranose, I will remind you, has a six-membered ring. Six-membered ring doesn't say anything about carbons. It says six members to the ring. So if you have a pyranose in a, if you have a pyranose, that means you have to have at least five carbons and an oxygen in that ring. You might have others, okay? So don't assume that pyranose means six carbons. It means a six-membered ring. And similarly, a um, furanose is a five-membered ring, and one of those members of the ring is an oxygen. So there's only four things that's in the ring. So if we're talking about fructose, which can commonly form in a furanose form, what you will see is that there's one carbon um, away from the ring over here, and there's one carbon away from the ring over here. Okay? And I've got a structure that I'll, that I'll post uh, for you for a, a cyclic form of uh, fructose. Okay? Now, one of the things you probably learned in organic chemistry was uh, the notion of uh, steric hindrance relative to sugars. And steric hindrance can be a consideration because these sugars, when they form rings, um, have hydroxyl groups that can have at least a little bit of interaction with each other. And for atomic nuclei, interacting too close can be problematic. And so um, one of the things that we discover is that in six-membered rings, uh, there's commonly two ways in which the ring itself can be arranged. And they're called conformations. And they really have more to do with the bond angles between the various atoms than anything else. So we can have, for example, alpha D glucose in two different forms. And those two different forms we refer to as the boat and the chair. I mentioned them in the song yesterday. Okay? The chair form is the one that you see on the screen. And the chair form I like to think about as a, kind of like a chase lounge. You've got a back where you put your head. You sit your butt down here. And you have your feet sitting off of the end down here. And it's laid out so that the hydroxyls that you can see are very apart uh, from each other. There's also uh, a form that we can have of this where instead of bending down here at the bottom, we bend upwards. And when we bend upwards, this hydroxyl has other chances to interact with things like this carbon number six's um, hydroxyl. And those aren't very favorable interactions. When we have it in that conformation, we have what's called the boat form. Okay? The boat versus the chair. Now, Chemically, they don't really have any different properties. And what we see is that the chair form will uh, predominate because it has less interaction between the hydroxyl and the hydroxyl over here. So the chair form is the more stable form, or the more commonly found, I shouldn't say stable, but the more commonly found form because it doesn't have those interactions that are unfavorable for it to um, exist. OK. I'm not going to talk about reducing sugars except to say 
one thing. Okay? You frequently hear the term reducing sugar used to describe a sugar. And I'm going to tell you what that means. A reducing sugar is a sugar that is very easily oxidized. And it's reducing because what it's doing is it's donating its electrons to something else so that that something else gets reduced. So it's reducing something else. In the process of giving up its electrons, it becomes oxidized. And that's what a reducing sugar is. One of the common ways that we can um, see evidence of a reducing sugar is if we take a solution, for example, of silver that's in the plus one state, and we mix it with um, a reducing sugar. A, an atom of silver that accepts an electron becomes metallic silver, and that will actually form a mirrored surface within a test tube. So you can actually see that happen. And it tells you that you have a reducing sugar because something gave its electrons to silver to make that happen. Okay? So that's what a reducing sugar is. Well, what's a chemical characteristic of a reducing sugar? For the purposes of this class, a reducing sugar is anything that is an aldose. Because aldehydes are readily oxidized. Now, yes, ma'am? Yeah. So a reducing sugar in this class will be an aldose. That is an aldehyde sugar. Glucose is an aldose. Galactose is an aldose. Ribose is an aldose. But fructose is a ketose. And ketoses are not so easily oxidized and will generally not be very strong reducing sugars. Okay. Well, what if we take a sugar and we actually reduce it? Instead of oxidizing it, what if we reduce a sugar? Well, now the terminology gets a little wango. When we reduce a sugar, we get a reduced sugar. And one of the most common forms of reduced sugar you can see right here is called sorbitol. And sorbitol is used as an artificial sweetener. Sorbitol looks an awful lot like um, glucose. Looks an awful lot like glucose. The difference being it's got a hydroxyl up here. Okay, It's got a hydroxyl instead of having an aldehyde. Well, that fools the, the, the sense receptors enough that our sense receptors perceive it as sweet. You commonly see sorbitol used in things like breath mints and things like that. Okay. And this is not technically like the other artificial sweeteners in the sense that you can metabolize this and get some energy out of it to some extent. You get about half the amount of energy that you get out of glucose. So it has reduced calories, but it still, in this case, gives you a sweet taste and um, probably isn't as nasty as some of the other ones are. Okay. I get a lot of questions about, about uh, artificial sweeteners. And I'll say a little bit more about those as we get a little further along. OK, so reduced sugars will, in general, have the alcohol. You'll notice there's no aldehyde um, or ketone in either of these two up here, and whereas the, the, starting the starting sugars were over here. And you saw a ketone get reduced. You saw over here a ketone get reduced. And that's what's happening. OK. Um, sugars can get phosphorylated, meaning they get a phosphate put onto them. And you've seen this can happen with amino acids. We'll see this happen later today, actually, when we talk about glycolysis, because the very first step of glycolysis involves putting a phosphate onto carbon number 6 of glucose. So phosphorylation changes glucose very much like it changed proteins. Glucose starts out polar, but uncharged. When we put a phosphate onto it, it becomes charged. And that phosphate also conveys a bit of energy to the molecule. So glucose 6-phosphate is actually at a higher energy than is glucose itself. 
And we can see evidence of that by virtue of the fact that it takes energy from ATP to put that phosphate on. So we see that happening here. We'll talk about the enzyme reaction for that in just a bit. OK. Um, ascorbic acid is, of course, vitamin C. And vitamin C uh, can be made in some organisms, ultimately from glucose. We are not one of those organisms, so we have to have vitamin C in our diet. But uh, rats, for example, can make their own vitamin C. So get some enzymes from a rat, and you can make your own vitamin C. You'll be all set. Okay? And you can see um, that it's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, just like glucose does. And it's been rearranged a little bit to make this vitamin C. Vitamin C, as I've talked about previously, is an antioxidant, meaning it's helping to prevent oxidation from happening. All right, I'm going through things fairly quickly here. Glycoside, here's a term for you. Glycosides can be extraordinarily complex. We look at glycosides very simply in this class. What is a glycoside? How do we get a glycoside? A glycoside is a sugar that's had its anomeric carbon somehow altered. Okay. So here's glucose. In this case, it's beta-D-glucose, you can see on the left. And you can see that this has been reacted with uh, methyl alcohol, methanol. And a methyl group has been put on in place of that hydrogen. The anomeric carbon, which is that first carbon, has been altered because instead of having a hydroxyl on it, it now has an O-methyl group on it. And we've just created a glycoside. Glycosides are very common. We will see glycosides form in the uh, synthesis of polysaccharides. We will see they form in the uh, formation of disaccharides. And we'll see they form in a lot of other cases as well. But whenever you hear the term glycoside, I want you thinking about the fact that the anomeric carbon has, in some way, been altered. OK. Laetrile is a glycoside. And there's the sugar part of it. You can see it right there. No, you don't have to draw the structure. This is a compound found in apricot pits. Um, and there's uh, an alteration to that hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon. OK, so much for the monosaccharides. Let's talk about disaccharides. I know you're just dying to talk about disaccharides, because I am. Disaccharides, um, as its name implies, have, uh, they contain two sugars within them. Okay. And if we look at this, we have uh, two different kinds of bonds that are being displayed here. We have what's displayed on the left as an alpha-1-4 bond. And it's called glycosidic because in the process of making this, we created a glycoside. Where was the glycoside? Well, it's right there because there's where the anomeric carbon is. And that hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon got altered again. It's called alpha-1-4 because carbon, the, the hydroxyl the uh, oxygen on carbon number one is linked to carbon number four of the next sugar. So if we, this is where counting or numbering your carbons really helps. Again, on the left, we have uh, carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. The other sugar, we have carbon number one, two, three, four. So we have an alpha, one, four. And it's alpha because this oxygen is going down okay, at 4, 5, and 6. We can also have an alpha, uh, other kinds of bonds. Here's an alpha 1, 6, and we'll see that both alpha 1, 4s and alpha 1, 6s are fairly common. The alpha 1, 6, we have the uh, oxygen that has been linked to the uh, uh, carbon number 6 on the other sugar. And you'll notice the way that we use a sort of a shorthand way of drawing is that we draw this starting down and then looping it up just to indicate that this really is an alpha, that is, that the bond is coming down. If we were to draw it anatomically correct, we would have it looking something like this, where the sugar on the left was a little higher, and the other sugar on the right was down below. Okay. So this is just simply a shorthand way of, of depicting that thing that I just described to you. OK, so disaccharides have two uh, sugars within them. Uh, the most common disaccharide that we will talk about is sucrose. 
And I don't like any of the figures that the books have for sucrose, so I used my highly artistic abilities to draw for you this sucrose structure. Okay? Sucrose is comprised of one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. Now, I hadn't previously shown you the cyclic structure of fructo fructose, so I'm going to show it to you right now. Okay? Forget for the moment we have a glucose above. Imagine that we have an H where that O is. So we have an OH, right? So we have an OH right here, all right? Sucrose is everything down below. And sucrose exists most commonly in what we call the furanose form. And the furanose is the five-membered ring, F for five. And if we count the carbons, we see we have carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. That makes sense because fructose is a hexose. And notice that in this case, we have two carbons away from the uh, ring. They're not part of the ring. In this case, carbon number two has interacted with that oxygen that was on carbon number five. In the case of glucose, we saw the Carbon number one interacted with the um, oxygen on carbon number five. And if we look at the orientation of this, the OH is up. It's the OH that determines whether it's alpha or beta. So sucrose here, if this were just sucrose, would be in the beta configuration, meaning the hydroxyl is up. Well, sucrose is interesting because sucrose is a glycoside. And in fact, it's what I describe as a diglycoside. It's a glycoside as far as glucose is concerned because the anomeric carbon has been altered. And where's the anomeric carbon in fructose? Well, the anomeric carbon is always the one that's attached to the oxygen. So this anomeric carbon in fructose is carbon number two. And it, too, has been altered. Now, the interesting fact about this interaction is that by creating this diglycoside, whenever you create a, a glycoside, the, the uh, molecule that's in that glycosidic bond cannot go back to a straight chain form. It cannot go back to a straight chain. So that means that this glucose can't go back to being an aldose can't do that. Well, aldose, as you remember, were very easily oxidized, right? Glycosides okay, will oftentimes not be reducing sugars, because we've altered the, uh, their ability to become an aldose. It's no longer an aldose. It's a glycoside. Sucrose consequently is stabler than glucose. Glucose is more easily oxidized. Fructose is more stable chemically than glucose. You hear about high fructose corn syrup. Why do you suppose people want to have high fructose corn syrup? And why not high glucose corn syrup? Because fructose is stabler. Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, you should be able to draw the, the structure of sucrose, since you already, since you're, I'm requiring you to know the structure of glucose, and I'm requiring you to know the structure of fructose. You simply have to put them together to be able to make sucrose. So you should know the ring structure of sucrose. OK. Um, another uh, disaccharide that's commonly encountered is lactose. And notice that lactose is different than lactate. Lactate's a three-carbon molecule we'll talk about later. Lactose is a sugar. Lactose is a disaccharide between galactose and glucose. Now, I'm not going to require you to memorize the structure of lactose, but I think you should know that it contains galactose and glucose. You should know that. I'm just going to show you here that it has 
actually alpha-1-4 bonds, the galactose on the left, the glucose on the right. Alpha-1-4 bonds. Okay. And there are a variety of other disaccharides that aren't quite so common, and I won't talk about those. Okay. Sucralose. I get a lot of questions about this one. The food manufacturers would love you to think sucralose is very natural because it's made from sugar. That's what they will tell you. Okay? So is dioxin. And I say dioxin for a reason because dioxin has some interesting structures in it. It has structures that have bonds between carbon and chlorine that don't occur in nature. How natural does this guy look with that chlorine attached to that carbon or that chlorine attached to that carbon or that chlorine attached to that carbon? It doesn't look very natural. Okay. Now, I don't know that there's anything wrong with sucralose. I won't even try to tell you there's anything wrong with sucralose. But I will tell you I worry about things that have bonds between carbons and chlorides. As we talk about artificial sweeteners, this is one I won't use. Okay? For what it's worth. All right. Um, polysaccharides. Polysaccharides, as their name implies, means they have many sugars. And the most common polysaccharides that we have, that we will talk about, are those that have as their monomeric units glucose. The monomeric units of most polysaccharides that we will talk about have glucose monomers. Okay. What you see on the screen is a very simple polysaccharide. It's a common polysaccharide found in plants. And plants use it as, as a way of storing glucose. It's called amylose, A-M-Y-L-O-S-E. And what it is is a long chain of glucose molecules that are linked alpha-1-4. There's the alpha bond, carbon number one. There's the four bond. And you can see that down here that it says 300 to 600, meaning that there are many of these that go into making up an amylose. Amylose is very simple in structure. It's a way for a plant to store a lot of glucose. I've alluded to the fact before that glucose is a poison as far as cells are concerned. And cells detoxify poisons like glucose by converting them into a different form. Okay, They convert them into a different form. This polymeric form of glucose is not poisonous. It doesn't cause problems for cells. Okay. Another polymeric form of glucose that uh, we will talk about is actually amylopectin. Now, this is just a schematic, and I'll, I'll show you the actual structure in a second. Amylopectin is another polymer of glucose. It's found in plants. And it's very much like amylose, except that it has, in addition to alpha-1-4 bonds, periodically it will have a branch as an alpha-1-6 bond. So you can imagine it will have some Y-shaped structures. And these are sort of depicted here. You can see here's a chain and there's a branch. Here's a chain there's a branch. And you can see the various Y forms of amylose, I'm sorry, of amylopectin. And on the bottom you see a comparison to a polysaccharide that we have in us, that is us being human beings, called glycogen. It's also a polymer of glucose. It also has alpha-1-4 bonds with alpha-1-6 branches. But in us, as you can see on the screen, the branches occur more frequently than they do in amylopectin. In amylopectin, the branches occur about, this is exaggerated a little bit here, they occur on the average about once every 30 to 50 glucoses. That's where the 1-6 branch occurs. In us, glycogen has branches occurring about every 10 
glucoses once in about every 10. I'm going to show you the structure now. The structure of glycogen looks something like this. Here is the polymer of the alpha-1,4 linkages that you can see on the bottom row. And here's a branch. Here's an alpha-1,6 right there. After that branch, this chain will continue as alpha-1,4s. So only the branch will have alpha-1,6. And that'll go off as alpha-1,4s, and the branch will branch, and the branches will branch, and branching will go on forever and ever. Okay. The only difference is between amylopectin and, and glycogen is that in amylopectin, the branches will occur less frequently. In glycogen, they will occur more frequently. OK. Cellulose. Cellulose is yet another polymer of glucose. It's used by plants to maintain cellular structure. It gives support to plant cell walls, for example. Well, how does it differ from the ones we've talked about? The difference it has is very subtle, but very important. The subtle difference is that glyco I'm sorry, that um, uh, cellulose instead of having alpha-1,4 bonds, has beta-1,4 bonds. <laughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> instead of having alpha-1,4 bonds, it has beta-1,4 bonds, right? And that subtle difference has enormous implications. We have enzymes in our body that will easily break down alpha-1,4 bonds between glucoses. Very easy for us to do that. We have no enzymes in our body that will break down beta 1 4 bonds. Okay? As a consequence, when we eat cellulose, we get none of the energy of the glucose that's in cellulose. If we eat glycogen, or we eat amylose, or we eat amylopectin, our enzymes break down that polymer and give us the glucoses, which we can use for energy. So that means, as far as we're concerned, that cellulose is a wasted form of energy. To break down that um, beta-1,4 bond requires an enzyme called cellulase, C-E-L-L-U-L-A-S-E. -L -L -E. Cellulase is found in bacteria in the rumen of ruminants, like cows. So cows eat grass because they can get a lot of energy from the cellulose that's in grass, because in their rumen, bacteria will break down that cellulose. We don't do that. I just realized there was something else I was going to say about uh, enzymes, and that was actually up here with respect to um, uh, lacto lac I'm sorry, lactose intolerance. I didn't mention it. I should have. Okay. I had the, the thing up there to remind me, but I didn't say it. Lactose intolerance is the thing I commonly get a question about. Lactose intolerance arises because as we get older, most of us produce reduced amounts of the enzyme that breaks down lactose. The enzyme that breaks down lactose is called lactase, L-A-C-T-A-S-E. And lactase is produced abundantly when we're born. But as we get older and we drink less milk and we need less energy from milk because we get energy from other things, we produce less lactase. And depending upon the culture that you come from, you may produce a lot less lactase. If you produce no lactase, when you eat a dairy product, what will happen is that lactose, which is the sugar that's found in milk, will get into your digestive system. And instead of being broken down like it is if you have lactase present, it will get into the intestines where the bacteria go, whoopee. They love it. They love it so much they make gas and all kinds of things. 
cause big problems, big discomfort. Okay? And you might wonder, why do we have it like that? Well, the reason we have it like that is we actually evolved to stop making lactase once we uh, were no longer children because we weren't drinking milk under the conditions under which we evolved. The evolution of lactose tolerance, which is making lactase as adults, that only evolved in the past 4,000 years. People say, show me, show me evolution happens. Well, there's a really good example. We started making lactase as adults okay, when we domesticated the cow. When we had those things available, there was an evolutionary advantage to us okay, to be able to break down that energy source, which was coming to us in the form of milk. Okay. So that's my lactase story for you. OK, the last things I'll talk about with respect to structures are other modifications to sugars that can happen. I mentioned phosphorylation was one. Here's another one making what are called amine sugars. So amines, of course, are things that are based on nitrogen. And here is an amine sugar, N-acetyl beta-glucosamine, blah, blah. It's based on glucose, as its name suggests. And it's beta, so we have up, down, up, down, up, right? And there's the amine that's, been, that's replaced the um, hydroxyl on carbon number two, and there's an acetyl group that's been put onto it. This is not an uncommon structure uh, to encounter. We're not going to spend too much time talking about it, but I will say briefly that this structure is actually used by insects to make chitin as a polymer. So this is actually commonly used as a polymer uh, within insects. We have other forms of other modifications that we do. OK, um, there's chitin, there's the polymer, OK, blah, blah. All right, now these polysaccharides that are there that we have, we use them for a variety of purposes. I told you how plants, for example, can use them to give their cell wall structural integrity. All right, bacteria have other arrangements that they use of uh, polymers of polysaccharides to give their cell walls some integrity. We don't do the, either of those. Our cell walls, by, we don't really have cell walls. We have cell membranes. They're much more fluid than a bacterial cell wall or a plant cell wall will be. Okay. Well, the plant cell wall uses something called a peptidoglycan all right, as a way of stabilizing their cell wall. I'll tell you what a peptidoglycan is. Okay. Glycan refers to the polysaccharide part. When you hear glycan, you're thinking of a polymer of a saccharide of some sort. The peptidal part is the peptide, meaning short protein chain. So bacterial cell walls have links between the carbohydrates and the peptides that link them all together in sort of a network that you can see there. So a peptidoglycan is something that has a peptide and a polymer of a um, uh, sugar. OK. Now, that actually leads me to my very last topic here, which is to uh, mention a couple of things. One is these guys here called Proteoglycans. Proteoglycans. What's a proteoglycan? Well, that should sound like a peptidoglycan, I hope. Right? So the glycan part tells you that you've got a polymer of a sugar. In this case, you actually have modified sugars that we, we use to make these. Okay. And they're linked to a protein. So we can see protein. And we see the various polymers of the um, modified sugars sticking off of it. That is, polymers of carbohydrates sticking out here. Now, I said that the, the sugars that are in these glycans are chemically modified. Okay? They're chemically modified. And they're chemically modified. We're not going to worry about the exact structure. 
but they're modified to have a lot of negative charges. A lot of negative charges. These negative charges, if you take one of these and you try to put it next to another one, they're going to repel each other, right? Well, imagine that you now make a polymer of them. You can imagine that that long chain of hundreds or thousands of those negative charges, if you took one of those chains and you put it next to another chain that had hundreds or thousands of negative charges, they want to get as far away from each other as they can. And they do. So when you look at these under an electron microscope, and this is just a drawing that we did, but if you look at these under the electron microscope, you'll see that these are very feathery looking structures. Each of those strands is trying to get as far away from the others as it can because they're all very negatively charged. Now I tell you this because this arrangement actually changes the chemical properties of these molecules. They absorb a lot of water, which is one of the reasons they look kind of feathery. And they actually change the chemistry of the water that they contain a little bit. Solutions that contain these proteoglycans will be very slimy. They actually function as lubricants. Okay. You've heard of synovial fluid? Everybody heard of synovial fluid? That's the lubricant that's in your joints that keeps your joints from getting too creaky. Synovial fluid contains one of these called hyaluronate. I'm not gonna, I'm not, you don't need to know it, but, but I'm just telling you that. And what this has is a very sliminess to it and a very much of a lubrication effect. These act more like an oil in an engine than anything else. Okay? Your snot is full of this sort of stuff. Very slimy, very slimy stuff. Those are the proteoglycans. And the last thing I'll mention, uh, oh, by the way, I didn't mention the category. The category is glycoproteins, and I'm hoping that you'll understand that a glycoprotein is sugar protein. Again, same sort of thing. Glycoproteins are, I mentioned them earlier in the, in the term, but glycoproteins are things that we find in our cell membranes that give our, and one of the things that they do is they give our cells identity. So the different blood types arise from the configuration of carbohydrates attached to proteins in our cell membrane. These are glycoproteins. Different configuration, different blood types. So a person who has an A type blood will have one configuration of carbohydrates on its cell membrane attached to a protein. The person has B will have a different configuration of carbohydrates attached to that protein in the blood cell. Okay. Questions? Should I slow down? How about a song? We're not done, but how about a song? OK, this is a fairly easy one. Yep, where are we at? Oh, don't tell me. Don't do this to me. Try it again. Yes. 
Hopefully that woke you up. Got you inspired for biochemistry. But now we're back to biochemistry. And what I want to say here, where did my thing go? OK. OK. We finished the structural considerations for carbohydrates. A bunch of nomenclature. Hopefully not too many structures for you. The only structures you have to memorize are the ones that I said, glucose, fructose, ribose, and sucrose. Right? The nomenclature is probably more complicated than the structures themselves are. Okay. It's time for us to turn our attention to metabolism. And metabolism is what I describe as the sum of all the chemistry of a cell. It's the sum of all the chemistry of a cell. And notice I said it's the sum. It's everything. So there's all kinds of metabolic reactions that we will talk about. And one of the things you learn about chemistry is that chemistry is an energy requiring or producing process. It's therefore appropriate that we think a little bit about energy as regards uh, biological processes and as they regard uh, chemical reactions. So I'm going to go through a very brief review for you of Gibbs free energy. I've talked about it briefly before. Gibbs free energy, the change in Gibbs free energy is a very important quantity for us with respect to a chemical reaction because the change in the Gibbs free energy tells us the direction of a reaction. If the change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction is negative, the reaction moves forwards. The change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction is positive. The reaction moves backwards. And if the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. Equilibrium, as I noted before, does not mean equal amounts of reactants and products. It simply means that the delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, is zero. The equation for the Gibbs free energy is that the delta G is equal to the, the that is, the, the, the change in Gibbs free energy for reaction is equal to the standard Gibbs free energy for a reaction plus RT, that is the gas constant R, times the temperature. And for us, we'll consider the temperature to be essentially constant. We'll talk about the temperature being about 300 degrees Kelvin times the natural log of products over reactants. We have natural log instead of base 10 log, and that's OK. The same rules we had for base 10 log hold here. If the ratio of products to reactants is greater than 1, the log term is positive. If the ratio of products to reactants is less than 1, the log term is negative. And if the ratio of products to reactants is 0, the log term, I'm sorry, is 1, the log term is 0. The standard Gibbs free energy is a characteristic of a reaction. It's a characteristic of a reaction. It's a characteristic of a reaction at standard conditions. Most reactions are not at standard conditions. But it tells us that the change in Gibbs free energy for any reaction under any conditions is equal to the standard reaction under standard conditions plus this RT times the natural log term. We can find the change in Gibbs free energy for any conditions by applying this equation. We're very interested in knowing, do reactions go forwards or backwards? Because cells will use the same reaction under some conditions going forwards. And in other conditions, it'll go backwards. And if you think about it, that might seem unintuitive at first. It might seem like the reaction is only going to go one way, but that's not true. The sign, the plus or the minus of the delta G, is related to the concentration of products and reactants. Under one set of conditions, let's say we had 10 times as much products as reactants, this log term will be positive. 
and will affect the delta G in a positive sense. On the other hand, if we have 10 times as many reactants as products, that is, we have a ratio of 1 to 10, that log term will be negative and will affect the overall delta G in a negative sense. Okay? So the only control that cells have for making things happen is altering products and reactants. That's the only control that they have. That's the only variables that they have in this equation. Changing the amounts of products and reactants. But that change is very important and very powerful for the cell to control metabolism. Very, very powerful and important for the cell to control metabolism. Now, I'm going to finish up here in just a minute. This is what I like to show is an energy scheme that depicts the flow of energy, okay, starting with fusion in the sun to make sunlight. Sunlight's captured in the form of energy as photosynthesis by plants. They capture that energy and use that energy to make glucose. That glucose is used to make ATP, whether by the plant or by somebody who eats the plant. ATP is used to do all the things that we do, which include movement, vision, talking, thinking, seeing, and making other molecules. So it reminds us that making molecules takes energy. It takes energy. It's a very important consideration. This figure depicts that relationship between processes that release energy and processes that take energy. We eat food, we're taking in energy. The energy we get from our food we use to do all the things that I just described to you. And we get that energy as a result of a process of breaking down those nutrients that are in the food and the breaking down of those nutrients we call catabolism. There's a word you should know. Catabolism. Catabolism literally is breakdown. Catabolism usually involves oxidation. It goes from bigger things to smaller things. That's what breaking down means. The opposite of catabolism is anabolism. You've heard of anabolic, right? Anabolism means to build up, to make. It takes energy to build a building. It takes energy to build a fat. It takes energy to build a protein. If we start with simple building blocks and we put them together, it takes energy to assemble them. So anabolic processes, which involve that assembly, anabolic processes require energy. And instead of being oxidative in nature, they're generally reductive in nature. Okay? That's enough for today, I think.